So in, in this processor, um, we're going to have basically three pipelines here, a long multiply pipeline, a memory pipe that, say, takes two cycles, and then a short ALU pipe here on the top. We have a uh, scoreboard like we had before, and this is going to track where, where data is available in the pipe. Where data is available in the pipe. And the architectural register file is sort of sitting at the end. So this looks relatively similar to the uh, in order issue, in order write back, in order commit uh, processor. But there are some interesting things here. If you compare this picture here to this picture here, we just dropped all these pipeline stages. So that's pretty cool. We don't have to bypass out of there anymore. We can just sort of shove the data in the architectural register file. And if we preserve read after write, write after write, and write after read dependencies, um, things, things should be OK. But let's see if we can actually do that. So let's first take a look at the scoreboard for this in order issue, in order, uh, in order fetch, in order issue, out of order execute, and write back an out of order commit processor. So the, the scoreboard looks very similar um, to the in order, in order, in order, in order machine. Um, and we can use it to track um, structural hazard on the write back port. And this is really important. If you try to have, let's say, a multiply and then an add after it, it's possible that the multiply and add if, uh, uh, under pipelining might have to go use the write back port at the same time. So you get a structural hazard. And we're going to show a pipeline diagram of that happening in the, in the next uh, slide. We still um, don't actually need to have a more complex scoreboard. So briefly, uh, someone asked in last lecture, in the scoreboard, do we need to track which functional units each value is going down the pipe? We still don't need to do that for this relatively simple pipe because for a write after write dependence, we're basically just going to stall. If you want to break that requirement, then uh, you need to start tracking more complex things in the scoreboard. And you may even want to have something like a register rename, which we're going to be talking about next class. And that's going to allow you to basically break a write after write dependence dynamically in the processor. So an important point here, um, because these pipe stages are different lengths now, <clears throat> in our scoreboard, we had different places where the bits, where the, where the entries in the scoreboard could be. But now if we go to execute an instruction which is long, we're going to put it in uh, one in sort of the first entry in the scoreboard, and it's going to march down every cycle as, as tracking the information as it goes down the pipe. But if we're trying to, let's say, execute a add instruction, it doesn't actually have to wait four cycles to get into the architectural register file. So we can actually insert here a one. And then it just marches down the balance of the pipe for a particular uh, uh, location. And this is what I was saying that because we're not going to allow write after writes hazards on a particular register, you're never going to have a case where there's basically multiple inversely ordered bits in this table. If you had that, you would actually have a more advanced scoreboard. And I'll show a picture of that a little bit later in today's lecture. OK, so let's, let's go through an example of how to use the scoreboard and how to walk through a in order issue, uh, in order fetch, in order issue, out of order execute, and write back an out of order commit processor. So here is the same code sequence we had in the previous uh, example case. So we're going to be using this throughout all of the class. <clears throat> let's, let's take a look at this and sort of see how this pipeline diagram happens and notice a few things. First, let's take a look at some uh, read after write hazards and what the pipeline has to do. <clears throat> MAL R5, R1, R4. This reads R1. Well, R1 is created 
let us multiply in instruction zero. <clears throat> so it actually has to wait to get the bypass here from instruction two is going to have to wait to get this value. So you can see here it's basically just stalled. And what's happening here is your in order issue. You can't go try to issue subsequent instructions under that. Later in today's class, we're going to be talking about pipelines which actually have out of order issue, such that while this is waiting around, you can think about trying to go and issue the next instruction that's not dependent on that previous instruction. And by doing that, we can get more performance, because we can basically be reordering instructions and trying to use our functional units and use our ALUs as much as possible. But for right now, we have a uh, bypass coming out of Y3 here, out of this multiply down into the uh, register file access stage of that next multiply. So that's sort of one thing that's going on. Um, let's take a look at another read after write dependence here. So another read after write dependence is actually register 11 gets written here and read down there. Well, what do we have to do anything special for this? So it sort of marches down the pipe. The write happens here. Let's see where the read for this instruction, instruction 4, tries to happen. Well, the read tries to happen there. Well, at that point, the data is actually in the architectural register file. We don't have to worry about any funny, funny bypassing or anything like that. Um, and you can sort of work through the rest of the, 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 the things going on here. But there's a few other things I wanted to point out in this picture. First, because you have different pipe lengths, you can actually see that, let's say this add here is writing the architectural register file before a previous instruction writes the register file in program order. And this has some, some consequences, some large consequences, when you're starting to think about uh, if, let's say, this instruction here, the multiply that uh, preceded the add took some sort of uh, fault or took some sort of exception. Because now you've basically changed the architectural register file before uh, anyone, be before that other instruction has finished. And that other instruction didn't actually finish. So what, is, what does that mean? Um, one other thing I wanted to point out in this picture, um, which is a really interesting case, is right here. So this add instruction here it's dependent on R12. R12 gets created here, and basically at the end of the stage, it's ready to bypass. So if we look down, we'll say, well, this instruction here, we don't even try to read from the bypass until here. So that value's ready. But for some reason, this instruction stalls. Can anyone see what's going on at that instruction? All of its inputs are ready. It's ready to go. It's a party to go to, but it doesn't issue. OK, so that, that is what's happening here, is that if you were to remove this I stall stage here, this would get pulled forward. And now you'd have this writing and that writing at the same time. So we actually have a structural hazard on the right port of the register file there. So you have to, 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 to stall. OK, so let's, let's take a look at how that shows up in the reorder, uh, uh, excuse me, how that happen, shows up in the scoreboard. So when we go to sort of look at this, um, so what's, what we have here is we have cycles. There's 18 cycles across the top. Or actually, there's 19 cycles across the top. Uh, the first one's zero, but I don't draw that. Um, if we look at, let's say, this cycle here, Instruction one, which is this add, is in the I stage. So it's in the issue stage of the pipe. So it's looking for its uh, uh, operands, basically. And what's going to happen is this add needs to check to make sure that it's not going to conflict on the right port of the previous mall. 
In this case, it doesn't actually happen. But when this instruction moves to here, so uh, this is what I was saying is that it doesn't actually put ones in the four location and sort of marches down. Instead, it's going to start here at the, uh, with only two cycles to go before it writes the register file because the, the pipe is shorter. So it has to check this location and says, well, for my register that I'm trying to write, is anything else currently scheduled to go write that location in two cycles? And our scoreboard can answer that question. If there was a one in this box, yes. We would know that there was a mall or some other instruction that had long latency that there would be a conflict. So when this instruction were to move here, this one would also uh, clocks every cycle and moves down our scoreboard, it's going to conflict at that point and we're going to know we're going to have a uh, write hazard on the register file. So we can, sort of, we can sort of see those things happening in our scoreboard. And then we, we can also use our scoreboard to actually detect that real case. So this case here, this last instruction, this last add, we're going to see that show up over here. So let's, let's try and find that. Okay, so we have uh, instruction six. It wants to basically move forward in the pipe, but it checks this location here and says, okay, or, or in this cycle here, instruction six basically should be in the issue stage, and it doesn't move out of the issue stage. It's, it's sitting in the issue stage. And it looks in this location, which is basically two, two cycles till the end of the pipe, and sees that there's a one there. The, the box is trying to indicate that. So it looks there and says, oh, there's a one there. That means I can't issue this stage and I need to stall. And we get the stall showing up. These other boxes are here to donate, uh, uh, here to represent the other ads that are happening and the other malls and things. So we actually check these other locations. Uh, actually, this is just the other ads. These are, we're going to check for this ad here, this ad here. This ad checks here and sees a conflict, so it has to check again the next cycle. That's why there's four little boxes vertically on that, on that chart. Um, other things, th this is just a different representation here. You can see R1 is being written and it has a long latency in the pipe. This other uh, register has a shorter, or other uh, register has a shorter liveness time because in, in our scoreboard because it's an add instruction. Okay, so do we have any questions about that before we move on to a more complex pipe? So this is assuming a fixed uh, latency for every instruction. That is correct. Or at least per uh, pipe or functional unit in the pipe. You can definitely have uh, functional units which have variable latency. So an example of that is, well, there's sort of two good examples of that. One is something like a divider unit. Sometimes people build divider units so that you keep dividing until uh, you're done. And it's sort of a way to shorten the length of a divide. Um, so that sometimes has variable length. Another uh, good example of this is something like a load that uh, misses in your cache in an out-of-order processor and you have to wait for the load to come back. Good ways to handle that actually um, in a scoreboard Sometimes scoreboards will just have an extra sort of special bit on the side for each destination register, which says, this register is just out to launch. You know, I, it's in some long variable length pipeline. I don't know what's happening on it. Don't try to bypass it. Don't try to do anything special with it. And just wait for it to come back and that bit clears. So uh, processors I've built uh, for these variable length instructions will typically just have an extra bit for maybe the different functional units, like one for maybe the divider and one for the uh, load miss case or something like that, such that you know if that uh, exceptional case happens, or if the load misses, or if the, uh, you go and take a divide which has a, a variable length, because divide can take anywhere from like two cycles up to like twenty cycles in some pipelines, and in every everything in the middle, you'll just mark a bit saying this register is not ready in the scoreboard, and then if someone tries to go read that register, it just knows to stall. So it's just a slower performance sort of way to deal with that. Um, but that's a, that's a, that's a tough, or tough case to handle. But a, sc a scoreboard can help there, and it's a sort of extra information in the scoreboard. 
OK, so like I said, we have this out of order commit processor. It's doing out of order write back, and it's doing out of order uh, commit. Ooh, well, out of order write back may be OK. Um, we maintain our write after write dependencies, so we're not actually going to end up with incorrect state in the architectural register file because of that. But something bad can happen is what happens if we go and try to take uh, an exception. So let's say we have our same instruction sequence that we've been looking at up to this point. And here, we're wandering around, we're going down the pipe, and this instruction here takes some sort of fault and it's figured out at the end of the pipe at our commit stage. So the multiplier goes all the way to down to the end. We end up with, uh, I don't know, the multiplies don't take a whole lot of great uh, faults, but let's say it, it takes some sort of uh, exception. What, what is, what is going to happen? Well, that instruction is dead. All the other instructions are dead because it took a fault. Unfortunately, we already wrote the register file. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. OK, so now we end up in our trap handler, or our exception handler, or interrupt handler, and all of a sudden, register 11 is just wrong. It has the wrong architectural value. So this is one of the reasons why people should try not to build out of order uh, commit. It gets, gets, uh, it gets tricky to have out of order commit with precise exceptions. Now there are, there are some ways to do it. Um, so one way is limit the types of instructions. So if you have an in order issue, out of order commit, out of order write back, what you could think about doing is you know that this doesn't write until this point here. So what if we resolve all of our uh, previous, let's say, all of the previous um, exceptions? If we move our commit point earlier in the processor, we can actually make this work and have precise exceptions. So if our commit point, let's say, is in the either memory one stage or first stage of the multiplier or something like that, at that point, you know, we haven't written it any other state here that's wrong. That write back hasn't happened. So we can still kill everything down. Unfortunately, that means that you can't have an exception happening here, here, or anywhere else sort of like later in your pipe. So that's, that's a problem. So you, you can limit the types of exceptions, push your commit point early, and still have an out of order commit processor with precise exceptions. But that even is tricky. So, so this is a great question. So why can we not have two commit points? Some processors do have two commit points. And some processors will have, uh, it's called sliding commit point. So that you try to commit things sort of early. And then if something else, uh, 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 for certain types of instructions, you can move the commit point later. But typically, you want to have a commit point in one place where you say, after this point in the pipe, all of the state is past this, has been committed, and those instructions cannot be rolled back, and those instructions cannot be undone. But there are examples of things where people will have a sliding commit point. Uh, I've actually built a processor which has a, a moving commit point, but it's, it's, it gets tricky because what it basically means is certain types of instructions cannot execute after certain other types of instructions, because if they do, you sort of violate that, that sliding commit point. Like this example here, if, if the fault can be taken here, there's no way to solve this problem. But you could have something where there's a sliding commit point where if you have these, a mall followed by, let's say, an ad, you can actually sort of slide the commit point out. So there are processor ideas that you can try to have a sliding commit point. But otherwise, uh, you, have to, you have to check. You know, that gets uh, uh, quite a bit complicated. But I don't really want to get into that uh, today. Uh, let's, let's leave that for sort of advanced topics discussion. But in, in what we're going to talk about in this class, we're going to say we want to have one commit point, and we want to say one place in the pipe is the canonical location that past that point, all the data that is in flight is, has executed and is committed. And we need to know sort of one location for that.